Welcome to the second edition of our journalism training titled How to Report for COVID-19. For those of you who may not have been with us last week for the first session, my name is Russell Brooks. I'm the Public Affairs Officer at the U.S. Consulate General here in Lagos. But facilitating today's program will be Sarah Wachter, a Paris Bird based journalist and trainer who trains for Africa Regional Services, our office in Paris. And she is a very distinguished journalist, having uh, reported for publications such as, such as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, uh, BBC Newsnight, I can go on and on. Um, and she's done training in places such as uh, uh, for the Ru Rwanda and the DRC, uh, she, in particular, has reported uh, or trained on a range of health issues, including Ebola. She holds a Master's of Science uh, from the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia University. So she is very well equipped to uh, provide the training that we're going to under undertake today. So with all of that, Sarah, please begin. Uh, Sarah. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome back to those of you who were with us for the first session, and welcome to you who are with us for uh, the first time. Um, we're going to launch in pretty quickly into the information for today. Today, we're going to be talking about fact-checking, uh, medical fact-checking, fact-checking officials, um, and understanding the very important data part of this story, the importance of understanding health statistics and testing statistics and what this tells us about the progression of the pandemic. Um, so we're gonna go through, and I'm gonna give you today uh, a whole suite of tools and techniques. I'm gonna give you some homework this time. Uh, to become a good health journalist means that you must really understand things like the different types of uh, medical studies, research studies that are uh, conducted, statistics, what these statistics mean. Everything has a specific meaning. Um, so before we do that, I wanna thank all of you for asking some very interesting questions at the end of the first session. What I've tried to do in this second session is to answer most of those questions through the content of what I will be providing you. Uh, but before I get to that, there are a few questions that are going to pull out uh, information going to answer some of those questions that fall a little bit outside of the content of today's presentation. And then we're going to move on. We're going to um, talk a little bit about, we're going to end our discussion on disinformation to start out with. But before we get there, just a, a couple of points. Um, one of you had asked a question about, um, you know, some of the protests that are going on right now and how that relates to the virus. Um, this is a very interesting question because uh, the United Nations Development Program is saying that because this pandemic is putting enormous pressure on economies and on societies and, uh, and on our businesses, that we are likely to see um, other crises crop up. And so it's very important for us to also, as a part of our reporting, report on how these two things are going to have an impact on each other. So absolutely, um, in African countries, um, the concern is um, rises in poverty and rises in um, security. So these are things for, uh, for journalists and uh, for you in Nigeria to, to take a look at. Um, the concerns that a lot of people are not uh, wearing masks, which is one of the most important measures that people can take to prevent getting the virus. How do you get people to take to wear masks? I would say, and this is probably the most important uh, theme through this whole course, you need to convince them of the science and the evidence behind wearing masks. For the past several weeks, there are more and more scientific studies coming out which show quite clearly that masks can cut down on the chances of spreading the virus. The most interesting of them showing the country of Japan, which has not put in place nearly as restrictive as you've seen other countries, other developed countries, has managed to keep the number of deaths quite low 
And then scientists are I think it's the population has been really vigilant about wearing masks. Very powerful um, piece of evidence that you can show people on why they need to wear masks. Concerning uh, an incident recently in Nigeria where a test, uh, patient, patient tested positive for COVID and was uh, refused treatment. Um, I certainly agree with you that on moral and ethical grounds, um, hospitals should not be turning these patients down. But I have to remind you that whether or not a hospital or a clinic decides to give treatment to a patient hinges on the public service agrees, agreements of a health sector and what they are required to do. And it's something that you need to look into, I think, uh, all of you as journalists. What are those public service agreements in Nigeria? For example, in the United States, we have a public service agreement in place, which legally requires any hospital that receives any patient seeking care, that they must care for that patient, even if that patient does not have health insurance. They are required by law to treat that patient. I don't know what the public service agreement is in Nigeria. It's something that you need to look into. Um, regarding uh, refusals to admit that people who are showing symptoms of a loss of taste or smell as COVID-19, um, you just need to take a look at the list of symptoms to know uh, for COVID uh, that the loss of taste and smell are two of the top indicators that you could be positive for COVID. So, you know, anybody reporting these symptoms should probably get a test. Um, and last, the concerns about the lack of statistics on whether or not children in Nigeria are getting um, access to online education right now. The best place to find those statistics you need to start probably with the statistics department of your education ministry and find out whether they are collecting these statistics. Somebody will be collecting these statistics uh, and sharing them with institutions, international institutions, that are also going to be studying this. The one I could recommend to you, uh, which is very involved in education, is the OECD in Paris. Um, even though they represent mostly Western nations, they are very interested in the worldwide statistics on education. They could be another resource for you. So that answers some of the questions that won't be uh, in the body of my presentation. I'm happy to take uh, more questions along the way. And last but not least, someone asked the question of finances. Certainly the impact of this pandemic on the economy is severe and is also something that should be a major part of the reporting that we do. This course that I'm having with you is going to be dealing specifically with the health part of reporting. We won't be going into the business aspect of it here. So let's uh, now finish the discussion we had at the end of it. Uh, if you could put the presentation up, we're gonna just finish our discussion on disinformation. And I'm going to give you a set of tools and a set of techniques for you to figure out when disinformation um, starts to surface in Nigeria. So if you could put the presentation up, we'll finish that discussion. Thanks. Okay, let's move to the next slide, if you would. Okay, next slide. There are now the, the good news behind this pandemic. Uh, concerns are so great about the disinformation uh, that is circulating everywhere in the world that there are now places that you can go to to check out when you hear about a major piece of disinformation which is circulating widely in Nigeria. I would suggest to you that no matter what the disinformation is that you're hearing about, that you go to one of these resources. These are people who have been checking disinformation and verifying those things which are disinformation. Um, any information that you find in any one of these resources, you can use uh, and publish in your reports. Although, of course, I would suggest to you that you make sure and attribute the source that you're using. So I would first go, if you could go back to that page, the previous one, that would be great. I would suggest to you that this is the first thing that you do. I think probably the vast majority of the rumors and the disinformation that you hear are already gonna be fact-checked here. 
For example, the last one listed here, Coronavirus Fact Checking Alliance, has a search box. I went to it the other day. There were 93 different um, rumors in Nigeria that had been fact checked. You can put in the name of the disinformation in their search box, or you can just put in the country Nigeria, and up will come every piece of disinformation that they have fact checked. And then you can actually publish this. So this is, I think, this is probably going to take care of the vast majority of the kinds of disinformation which you're going to be encountering. Uh, in Nigeria or anywhere. As you know, disinformation, just like the pandemic, uh, has no problem crossing borders and many of the disinformation rumors you're going to be hearing have been circulating widely in other countries in Africa and, and probably all over the world. So I would say come here first. Uh, next slide, please. I also want to call your attention to a couple of other free resources. The first one is the Verification Handbook. This is a very interesting tool. It's just been updated a few months ago. Understand that disinformation also can be doctored photos uh, using artificial intelligence to put out false videos. It can be quite complex trying to fact check this. There's a whole series of tools and techniques that you can use also to fact check photos and videos. And another one that you can go to, I think, is called the Global Health Now's Expert Reality Check. This is another good resource on uh, disinformation on the coronavirus that has been fact checked by scientists. And another place to go to is firstdraftnews.org. If you're not familiar with First Draft News, they are also a wonderful resource for tools for journalists um, dealing with disinformation. So these are also part of your tools in your toolkit. Next slide, please. I'm just showing you as a, this is an example of the kinds of posts that you're probably seeing on a regular basis. We all are. I get them on my phone every morning. Um, it's an Instagram post by someone called Brast uh, saying that Dr. Tedros, the Director General of the WHO said, we must recognize the victory of Africa in front of the COVID-19. Uh, we have just accepted the use of these remedies. Westerners have finally seen the traditional strength of Africa before this pandemic. Soon we will proceed to the sharing of organic COVO and organic COVID mana. We want this message to be shared around the world. This is a classic example of disinformation, this one. Uh, happening to appear on Instagram. And there's some things by looking at this that you can tell uh, that for me, we're going to talk about a sniff test in a moment, ways that you can see that this can't really be real. First of all, um, the director of the World Health Organization, I can't imagine is going to be pitting uh, Africa against the developed world. That just wouldn't be something diplomatically that the head of a major international institution that has a global membership just wouldn't be doing this. Um, this is designed to try to, you know, create conflict, North versus South, uh, Westerners versus Africa. Uh, things like uh, capitalizing victory of Africa, that's bad uh, style. Uh, again, that's designed to kind of manipulate and whip up sentiment, uh, whip up local pride, Africa versus the West. Um, and at the very end, we want this message to be shared around the world. That's the kind of line that you see in these email chain letters. I can't imagine that a press release by Dr. Tedros would have anything like that in there. And also look at the name of this person, uh, Grast. The first thing I would do is go and check this person out. Uh, what other posts has this person been posting? On what topics? Uh, where does this person work? Can you go and verify this person's professional credentials? Why are, why are they writing about this? Um, there's a very sophisticated movement going on during this pandemic of people who are against vaccines, what are called the anti-vaxxers. Um, I did a little bit of research on him, and indeed, that's what he is. He's part of one of these people who's trying to sow a lot of doubt and confusion about the pandemic, about a possible vaccine. So let's look at the sniff test next. Next slide. 
So these are some of the things that you need to look at. If you're checking out disinformation and you don't find it in any of those resources uh, that I gave you, this is the kind of stuff that you can do when you've got a post like that. First of all, check out the, uh, check out the web address. Uh, often, it's not a common address like .ng or .net or .com. Uh, it's got a kind of funny letters in it. And that's a sign that it's not completely a legitimate organization. Or another strategy is a lot of times some of these uh, more sophisticated operations will buy the web address of a media organization that has closed its address. So you think it's coming from a news organization, but it's a closed address. So you need to find out whether that address is real or not, whether this is really someone from CBS News or they've actually just bought this name. Check out things like errors in grammar. A lot of the people who do these posts uh, don't speak a fluent uh, English because they happen to come from countries where they didn't receive good education in English. Um, and this is a sign of, of people who are, you know, not really professionals. Uh, there's typos, there's grammatical mistakes uh, in, their, in their posts. They've capitalized certain letter words that shouldn't be capitalized. Uh, Director General, for example, in that previous post, normally that would be capitalized. That's someone who doesn't understand professional style. That's not a pro professional. It's not a professionally looking post. Uh, next slide, please. Has the information been verified? Do a news search on what this person is saying. And if you do not see any information similar to what is in that post, I wouldn't publish it. It's not been verified. Check to see if the language is a bit exaggerated. Um, you know, internet language that in uh, these people are too. In the pandemic, people are afraid of getting this disease. They feel vulnerable. They can be manipulated easily. Or also, if it incites some kind of hatred or anger towards a different group, that's another sign that it could be disinformation. People don't talk like this in major organizations. Next slide. Do a Google search. Find out what this person has written about. Find out where they work. Find out, do they have a consistent point of view or are they always writing on a certain subject? Make sure they exist. Make sure this person works there. Find out what they do and what capacity. Pick up the phone. Don't just verify through Google alone. Pick as well before you do any publishing of any of this information slide. Next slide. Now, correcting disinformation also is a bit tricky. We have found out over the past four or five years that fact checking doesn't necessarily change people's minds. Once people have seen enough disinformation, they do believe it. It's very difficult to change minds, even by showing them the facts. What that means is if you do, if there is a disinformation room getting widely in Nigeria that needs to be corrected because it's starting to change behavior. For example, people are starting to take a particular treatment that could be dangerous or in any event not helpful. Uh, when you do correct in your article, focus on the truth and don't give a lot of space to the detailed misleading claim. Uh, really focus on the evidence of, you know, that this does not work and all the scientific evidence that proves that. Don't give too much of the information on the rumor itself. And the second thing to think about is that don't correct every piece of disinformation that you see, because that is also a strategy on the part of disinformation uh, 
conspiracy theorists, people who are spreading disinformation. They want you, if you work for a legacy outlet, to actually publish something on it because then that gives actually credibility to the piece of disinformation. It's appearing in a major respectable publication. So don't give unnecessary at attention to every idea that you see. Only those that you think are spreading like wildfire through the social media outlets in, in Nigeria that could really be a problem for the public health of the country. Uh, don't give uh, credence by fact-checking every piece of disinformation that, that comes your way. Be very selective. Only those that really are having an impact on the society. Next slide. Any questions at all before we move on? About disinformation? Sarah, we're checking to see if we have any questions in the chat box right now. So just give us a moment. That's fine. No questions yet. Okay, no questions as of this time. Why don't we move on? Oh. And uh, Let's move on. Yes. Let's move on. Next slide, please. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, two kinds of fact checking now um, medical fact checking and also fact checking leaders. Um, one of the things you need to know about medical fact checking. Um, and Russell, I think, made reference to this the other day, and I'm in complete agreement with him. Because the government in Nigeria is not always trusted by the public uh, on, on what they say, it is perhaps better to try to get uh, medical facts checked through institutions at national level, of course, such as your Institute of Medical Research, but also through contacting major international institutions such as uh, WHO, CDC Africa, and also at uh, the level of, the, of uh, the African Union. And if you've got experts who are addressing it from these three different levels, perhaps more credibility to the facts that you have uh, been verifying through three different sources. So check on those three levels, national, continent-wide, uh, and international, which will help build, hopefully, uh, the authority and the credibility of the facts that you are presenting to your audience. So check on three levels. Talk to experts and, and, and three different levels. Next slide. One of the things you have to remember, and this is very important, uh, coronavirus is a brand new disease. We have only discovered this since it cropped up in China the end of last year. What that means is there has been no medical research that was done prior to this point. So people talking about possible cures or treatments or vaccines of any type, the research on that is at a very early stage. So you need to be quite skeptical about these when you're checking your facts. We are from having um, a scientific consensus on just about anything concerning this pandemic, whether we're talking about who gets it, what the treatments should look like, who survives and who doesn't. Um, and yes, research is moving at a very rapid pace. Every week, uh, there are more and more studies coming out. But keep in mind that um, nothing is definitive at this point. Everything needs to be checked out. Next slide. So let's talk about a very important case in Madagascar, which several of you have referred to. How do you fact check this herbal mix that Madagascar is talking about? How do you professional journalistic style be safeguarding the public health Madagascar Corona Herbal Mix. Africa, despite world headline, because right from the start, and this is very important in a 
internet age, the warning is there. The WHO uh, is concerned that we don't know enough about this herbal mix. So right away, anybody who reads this headline and doesn't read the article will already know that there are concerns about this herbal mix. Now let's look at the first paragraph and see how this journalist uh, treated, this, um, treated this. Madagascar is putting its self-proclaimed plant-based cure. Notice how, how cure is put in quotation marks. In other words, we're not giving credence that this can cure COVID-19. This is what they are saying, but that doesn't mean it is a cure. It's level of separation. It's not verified. It's, that's the way of showing it's not. Despite warnings from the World Health Organization that its efficacy is unproven. As I said, these are very early days in the study, in the medical research, looking at so many different possible treatments and vaccines for this disease, but it's, we're at a very early stage. Let's look at the rest. Let's look at the rest of the article now. Next slide. So first of all, and this is something you can follow in your reporting, there will be other herbal treatments that will be floated in the coming months and perhaps years as long as COVID-19 is with us without a cure. So the first thing is what's in it? What is in that herbal mix? Well, it's isolated compounds extracted from Artemisia, which is effective in malaria drugs, the WHO noted, but the plant itself cannot treat malaria. In other words, there's something interesting in here. This is what it does, and this is what it does not do. Then every article must talk about what are the dangers of using this herbal-based medicine. A quote from the head of the WHO Africa says, she is concerned that people who drink the product might think they are immune to COVID-19 and engage in risky behavior. This is one of the concerns with a lot of the possible cures which are floated. People will think, if I take this herbal cure, I don't have to wear a face mask. I don't have to wash my hands. I don't have to try to keep my distance. People will drop their guard. And the only things that we have that will uh, save us right now are public health measures. They are the only things that will work in helping prevent us getting this disease. And then there's a quote from her saying, we are concerned that touting this product as a preventive measure might make people feel safe. In other words, it may not poison you to take 12 cups of an herbal cure per day, but it will give people a false sense of safety. There is a danger in a, such a treatment like this. Let's go to the next slide. Having said that, it's also important to look to the future. But what is what are research institutions doing to actually look into this herbal mix to see what's happening? Well, the African Union had said that it is trying to get the technical data from Madagascar on the remedy and that it would pass it over to the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to evaluate it. So actually there is research. There are gonna to try to get some evidence from Madagascar. They are gonna to try to study it. And the AU says, this review will be based on global, technical and ethical norms to garner the necessary scientific evidence. In other words, we need to study this. We need to see whether this will be, serve any kind of usefulness uh, in fighting COVID-19. So also take a look and see what kind of res research is being planned for the future. And yes, they are looking into the technical data. Hopefully Madagascar will supply it and it will be studied. So you see how this is a responsible way to look at these kinds of traditional medicines which are being talked about right now and will continue to be discussed, I think, in, in many countries. Next slide. Uh, before we move on, on to research, is there any questions at all about what I just went through or on disinformation, Russell, that you want to ask me? 
one was referring to your use of the term anti-vaxxers. I'm not sure that everyone understands yes. that phrase. So if you can explain it to them. I will. There is uh, a global movement afoot. It's in the US, in Italy, in Africa of people who are trying to convince the world that vaccines are not safe, that vaccines can make you sick. And in fact, they could uh, really sicken your children. And as a result, it's a very sophisticated campaign of people uh, using social media to put those messages out there, putting out um, research which has been discredited, for example. Um, and they're in a very sophisticated use of social media, trying to target different vulnerable groups, such as you know, mothers with several children who uh, are certainly always concerned about the health of, of, of their children. Um, and so anti-vaxxers are part of this sort of global movement who are using social media to put out quite a campaign of disinformation. And in this pandemic, they have really stepped up their efforts to try to fight against uh, the creation of a possible vaccine. Uh, Another question uh, was about how to spot fake photos or fact check photos. That's a very good question. Unfortunately, I have usually teach a whole course how to do this. Some time to go through all the techniques. What I would suggest that you do is there are free tools use to spot uh, photos that have been doctored and videos. We are the verification handbook, which is one of the tools that I mentioned to you. You need to actually go into the handbook, take a look at some of them. There are ways to fact check whether people are real instead of bots, uh, ways in which you can check the weather uh, in a photo, for example, to see whether or not that photo has been tampered with. There's a whole suite of techniques that you can use to try to determine uh, whether or not a photo or a, a video is real. You need to get familiar with these techniques. You need to practice them. Um, it is more of an art than a science. Um, sometimes now more videos are becoming sophisticated and sometimes require uh, someone who has a background in digital forensics to actually determine if the video has been faked or not. But there is a whole suite of tools that most of us as journalists can use to try to determine whether a photo or a video is, is false or doctored. If I could add something, uh, Sarah, for the general information of the audience. Um, one, there's a very, very uh, renowned organization um, that facts checks um, information in Africa called Africa Check. And they actually do training yeah. how to uh, check photos. Um, one of the representatives is located here in Lagos. He oftentimes uh, does presentations and one of the key features is how to fact check photos. And uh, those of you who are interested in that aspect might want to contact him or contact his organization. And I'm quite certain they will uh, discuss uh, the tools that Sarah is describing. The other thing that I know can be problematic in your news organizations is oftentimes you, the journalists, don't really have much input into the photos that your media organizations, especially your newspapers, are utilizing. Um, basically, a total separate area is uh, working on the photos. And uh, also, I know oftentimes, uh, totally different people are working on headlines. And they can be quite misleading as well. But in terms of the photos, well, I think what you also have to do is speak up in your organizations. And so oftentimes I notice in Nigeria in particular, the same photo is used every time we're talking about some type of uh, uh, ethnic conflict or uh, you know farmer herder disputes or et cetera, okay? No one is bothering to uh, fact check these photos. No one is even bothering to update the photos, okay, as journalists. As much as Sarah's trying to do a very good job with you in terms of uh, uh, improving your technical capabilities, another thing that you are going to have to do is speak up in your own organizations and demand more professional behavior. So that's a little commentary from me. Thank you. Any other questions, Russell, or should we move on to the uh, next uh, part? Let's move on, and I'll continue to check the chat, the, uh, chat box. 
Okay. Um, are you a couple of examples? Can be mostly. Keep discussing in Africa um, potential to vaccines, kinds of medical research. Uh, let's say, for example, the African Academy of Sciences actually does uh, do a piece of research on uh, the herbal mix for Madagascar, for example. How? What are the really the best practices for how you would actually explain this to your to your readers or to your listeners? Uh, and I'm showing you this is from some recent reporting on hydroxychloroquine, which, as I'm sure you all know is a very controversial uh, discussion going on uh, among scientists and, and at the political level uh, in Africa and in many other countries. So this is just an example of what I think um, is the kind of things that you would wanna put into a paragraph talking about a piece of research. Stop saying a promising laboratory study. In other words, study done on cultured cells, right? So basic types of research are that you're going to be looking at. And I'm also gonna give you a toolkit for you to familiarize yourself more with medical research terms and different kinds of, so a promising laboratory study cultured cells found that chloroquine could block from aiding cells. So in other words, here's the study and what it looked at and it's an important part of reporting on medical research. And then it explains to your reader, which it must do to replicate and cause illness. So, you know, if you can block these invading cells, it won't cause illness. However, drugs that conquer viruses and test tube or Petri dishes, and that's what we're talking about in these cultured cells, do not always work in the human body. So what happens in the lab isn't necessarily gonna work in a, in, in a human body. And studies, of hydroxychloroquine, which is a different type of medicine, hydroxychloroquine, have found that it failed to prevent or treat influenza and other viral illnesses. In other words, giving the reader the best understanding that we have at the moment. There is a promising study. It looked good for people with mild cases. If it will work in human beings, the only research we have right now in human beings found not for the COVID-19 because it's too early to say, but so this gives a complete picture of what we know from this small study. Looks promising, don't know if it will work in the human. Um, we have looked at a different version of this in the past and it didn't work against similar kinds of viruses. This is what we know today. So this is responsible reporting on medical research. What kind of study? What did it show? Um, what did it not show? And this is what we know today. Next slide, please. Here's another example of uh, reporting. This is on a human study. A study from China did include a control group. Now, I will show you the different kinds of studies in this course in a very short form. But in a human study, there's often half the patients are given the medication and half are given a placebo, which is a pill of sugar that does nothing. So in this case, it had a control group. That meant that half the patients were given the treatment and half were given a placebo or suggested that hydroxychloroquine might help patients with mild cases of COVID, right? Then it says, how large was this? It was a small study, 62 patients, right? You must realize beside the uh, treatment, it has to be tested in thousands and thousands of people. For example, right now, there are two vaccines that are going through human trials. One is being tested on 10,000 people and one is being tested on 30,000. That's the level that really counts, that kind of level. The story goes on to say, the doctors evaluating the results knew which patients were being treated. In other words, in the gold standard of research, we have what are called double-blind uh, studies. 
because of this placebo effect where some people think they feel better even though they've been given a pill of sugar. And sometimes the doctor or the person actually giving the treatment also can have an influence if they know they are giving the treatment to this person and a sugar pill to the other. So this was not a double blind study, which can also influence the results. So the doctors evaluating the results knew which, which patients were being treated and that information could have influenced the judgment of those patients. So it was not double blind. Even if the findings hold true, they will apply only to people who are mildly ill because that's who was studied. And researchers themselves have said more studies were needed. So you see, it tells you the study, how many people, what kind of study, what did it show, what were its limitations, and what needs to happen next, all in two short paragraphs. So this is really good reporting on medical research. Next slide. So before before we move on, um, later on, I'm going to show you these different kinds of studies and give you a, a toolkit on it. But I wanted to show you a couple of examples. You can actually follow these models in your reporting. Are there any questions on those studies that I went through? Okay. Hey, Sarah? Yes. yes. We do have a few questions concerning what you've uh, discussed in this section. So one ask, uh, since Madagascar has come out with a presumed cure for coronavirus, is it not wise for the WHO to put the herbal drink into the necessary medical tests? I am of the opinion that the herbal drink would have gained more attention if it had come from any of the developed countries in Europe. That's very interesting. Um, realize that uh, the search for possible treatments and uh, vaccines is very large and going on in many different organizations and is costing billions and maybe even trillions, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure that we know whether the WHO will be looking at uh, these kinds of herbal treatments. Um, hopefully uh, they will, but the, the answer is I don't know whether or not they're looking at this or not. I think for the most part, uh, what I can say based on my own research as a health journalist, uh, organizations like the World Health Organization, the CDC and the global pharmaceutical companies at this stage, and we are very early in our search for solutions, are looking at two things. They're looking at possible vaccines and there's a whole host of those that are being studied because that would be the best case solution. And others are looking at uh, a suite of treatments. Um, of, and what they're doing there is they're looking at different drugs that seem to help with uh, other kinds of similar viruses. The first thing they're looking at are those that have shown some results in similar kinds of viruses. And that's about where things stand right now. Uh, I don't think they've really gone much beyond that. Um, there is only so much money and so much time. And I think they're trying to look at what are the best bets right now. Those things which are you know, a bird in the hand, things that we know about already that have been well-researched, that are say, have been declared safe by many uh, health regulators like the US's Food and Drug Administration and vaccines, which is the ultimate solution. And this is where most research is right now. That doesn't mean it won't change, but until they exhaust these two sources, I'm not sure whether or not they're looking at traditional medicines. But to be honest, someone should ask the World Health Organization that question. Are you looking at uh, traditional herbal treatments as a part of your research? Uh, my answer is I don't know. And I think uh, you're basically uh, gonna present that answer to this next question. Is there any empirical test or clinical test that debunks the claim of Madagascar for their COVID-19 herbal solution? Uh, well, as I said, this is one of the things you need to keep in mind as, as journalists covering the pandemic. We don't, this is a new disease and research is at a very early stage. And we don't know until somebody launches a clinical study, we just don't know. For you as health journalists, I think that would be a very interesting question for one of you to put forth uh, to the World Health Organization or to the CDC in Africa 
or other research organizations. Uh, will you be launching any kind of clinical trials on this herbal mix? Ask them, find out. And another question, the indefiniteness of research on COVID-19 has an effect on the consistency of information about the virus. Does this not make it a little difficult to educate the public? We as journalists, and this is very important, have to learn how to handle how we speak to our readers and our listeners. And the way we can do that is to tell them what we know and what we don't know all the time. Now, what we don't know, this is going to change through time. The classic example is what I referred to uh, earlier today on face masks. In truth, many Asian countries have, because they've had more epidemics like H1N1 um, and other, other kinds of epidemics in recent years, they've had more experience with these than we've had in Western countries. As a result, th there is a widespread practice in many countries in Asia to wear masks. Uh, and there's a high degree of compliance. We've never really studied it scientifically until this pandemic with any degree of seriousness. So now we are researching it. What we need to do with our readers and our listeners is say, this is what we know and this is what we're studying. We need to constantly tell them what we know and what we don't know. Uh, that's how you clear up the confusion and it will change through time and you have to let them know that this is a fast evolving story, the story of understanding and researching uh, how we can protect ourselves against the pandemic, what kinds of treatments there could be. Uh, there's a lot that we don't know now, but we are researching this intensely and to give them the news as the research comes out. For example, I think that this uh, scientist, scientific consensus coming out of Japan on masks is very interesting and should be a story that I think most um, health journalists should, should be thinking about running um, a story about. Because when scientists say, take a look at Japan, they've only had 700 deaths because there's been widespread use of masks. They've never closed their public transport. They've kept restaurants and bars open and yet they've managed to keep the disease at a very low level. I find that very interesting. And that is a way to communicate something which is based on what scientists are saying and is a bit hopeful that the research is getting stronger every day that masks can provide a better and better protective barrier against the pandemic. Okay, I'll ask one last one because I know you want to move on. Uh, if the yes. WHO has clearly not given a nod to any proven COVID-19 vaccine, doesn't it have the power to sanction any country or organization that claims to have discovered such and exported it? I assume we're talking about the World Health Organization or maybe the CDC. Um, the WHO. That's a very interesting point. Or the WHO, that's a very interesting point, but I would refer back to uh, what I told you earlier. The WHO now has a, a group of people who are working 24 hours a day to fact check any of these claims. Um, understand that they don't have the power to sanction their membership. That's not how the WHO works. They don't have that kind of authority. That authority is only on a national, on a national basis. They don't, they, they, you really can't look to them for that. But what they are doing, and I think it's very positive, is providing all the available evidence by studying any kind of disinformation out there about any potential vaccine. And they're putting it out there and they're updating regularly 24 seven the information on it. And I think that already is um, a very strong approach. Thank you, Sarah. I think that's gonna be our last question for now, but you made a very excellent point. I know for the most part, the reporters uh, in this particular program are health reporters. And so you may not uh, have a lot of familiarity with diplomacy and international politics, but of course, that's my specialty. <laughs> so, so she's absolutely correct. The WHO does not have the power to sanction its member countries. Um, if you recall the recent dispute between the United States and China concerning the WHO, it becomes pretty obvious that the WHO has to be very, very sensitive 
to the concerns of its member countries, especially because they are funding the WHO. So no, they're not going to sanction countries and they have great difficulty at times with even speaking out at times if it is in the, uh, if it's not in the interest of those member countries. So you're health reporters, but you want to learn as much as you can about the full context of all these issues. So Sarah, you can move on. Another very important part of, of this pandemic uh, is that there is, before this pandemic, there has been a whole body of best practices, which has built up through history on what should be the best practices of uh, giving advice to the public who, what pol political leaders should be doing and what health authorities should be doing. And so this is built up, especially in the it's, the CDC and other organizations have built up a whole body of, of best practices on this. In this pandemic, there have been leaders who I think have done a wonderful job of following these best practices, but there have been others uh, who have not and have politicized this pandemic. And so it's very important and it's an important part of our role as health journalists the whole leaders, whether they are religious leaders, political leaders, business leaders, or community leaders, to hold them accountable for what the health authorities are saying we should be doing um, to best manage this, this pandemic. So we need to, to check what our political leaders are saying and whether it really lines up with what scientists are saying or is diverging from it. It's a very important part of our job. It can be dangerous as well. So let's talk a little bit about that. Next slide. So the reason why leaders are politicizing the pandemic is because, because it's putting our systems under enormous pressure. It's putting our political systems under pressure. Uh, it's showing all the cracks uh, that exist in all of our societies. It's putting pressure on our constitutions, on, uh, uh, on overreach on the part of security services, putting enormous pressure on even worse than we all suffered during the financial meltdown of 2009. So, you know, this pandemic is putting us under an enormous amount of pressure, and especially the leaders, the political leaders. Next slide. So we see some common themes in those leaders who are politicizing this pandemic, and it's happening in many countries. It's not just happening at a national level, it's happening at regional level and municipal level. Uh, and it's not good, but I want to just remind you what some of these are. Some of you are very familiar with them, and I'll mention a few others because they may crop up. Just like the pandemic, I think, you know, bad practices uh, jumps borders, just like best practices jump borders. And there's a lot of uh, politicians saying, you know, we can't put public health ahead of the economy, which is actually a kind of a false setup. You know, uh, most research shows that those governments that do a really good job by responding effectively to the pandemic are able to keep the disease in check and able to open the economies faster and wider. So that's a fall. Uh, there are many leaders saying that some are there. against health measures in, in different ways. So these are some of the common ways in which uh, different leaders are politicized in the pandemic. Um, next slide. But there are others, of course, as well. Um, the opposition, it's given them an opportunity to make all kinds of unverified claims, to snipe at the, the party in power. Uh, some leaders are, you know, talking about cures that at this point are not proven. They're being studied, some of them, some of them are not, but, you know, the things that we don't know yet. Um, some leaders are calling for, for unity. Uh, and actually, this is a bit of a trap for journalists as well. It's a way to stop any kind of legitimate criticism of actually what kind of a job they're doing in the pandemic. So that's another of the way in which this pandemic can be politicized. Next to this slide. 
you know, there's all these uh, other types of ways to politicize saying that, you know, curfews or lockdowns are going to crimp your liberty or it's, you know, saving lives versus the economy. Mixed messages, you know, different leaders are saying different things. The public gets confused about what they should be doing. Um, some government leaders um, are claiming that the numbers of infections or deaths are high because, you know, certain governments want more aid money. Um, so these are other ways in which some leaders, you know, politicize the, the pandemic. So next slide. What do we do about this as journalists? We, we need to to what the health authorities say we should be doing uh, and that they don't diverge substantially. Um, and of course, managing the crisis. Uh, and also because it can maybe get us to cover these stories instead of asking the really tough questions on whether testing and treatment and isolation and protective equipment is, is enough. Uh, that's, that's why uh, uh, leaders politicize a pandemic. They want to prevent us from, you know, really holding them accountable and get us to write about this instead of writing about the way in which the pandemic is being handled. Next slide. They're also doing it to try to undermine the leadership of, of health directives and, you know, also to weaken the ruling party, you know. Um, so, you know, these are all some of the reasons why uh, pe people do it, why the leaders do it. Leaders are under enormous pressure. And I think we have to be frank about the fact that this is a pandemic that caught the whole world unprepared. Um, we hadn't been studying pandemics enough. We hadn't, and we haven't, many countries haven't had enough testing capacity, enough protective equipment, uh, enough research in place. It's caught most countries off guard, to be fair. So, you know, putting governments under pressure. Next slide, please. About that we need to hold our leaders accountable, you know, to the science, to what the science and what the facts are telling us. Really saving lives is the only frame. Uh, so when, you know, a leader is saying to you whatever they're claiming, you need to ask them, based on what evidence, based on what statistics are you saving, what, based on what proof. You need proof. You need statistics. You need evidence for why they are saying what they are saying. You can't just report whatever any leader is saying. You need the hard facts. You need the science that backs up what their claims are. Otherwise, it's an empty claim. You need to hold them to the science. You need to hold them to what health authorities are saying. And it can get a bit sensitive, I'll, I'll, I'll grant you, but this is, this is what we need to do because lives are at stake here of our citizens and we need to hold them accountable. Next slide. I saw that one of the questions in the chat box had to deal with uh, a local matter where at least uh, two of the government yes. in Nigeria uh, claimed that there were no COVID-19 cases in their states. Um, you just mentioned that you, we, or these journalists, should hold them accountable, should ask hard questions as to uh, what is the proof behind these claims. Um, by the fact that someone asked this question, that suggests to me that they're a little unsure as to how to do that. Well, this is where you need to get uh, the best available statistics on the number of new infections, the number of deaths uh, in your area. Uh, do you have access to those health statistics? Or we're going to talk about where you can get access to other information as well. Uh, one of the other things that you can do if you don't have access to those statistics, but you should probably have them because uh, uh, hospitals and clinics need to report that information to the national authority, either the CDC or the health ministry or, or both, and probably other sources as well. You need to get access to those statistics. Uh, and, and actually report those statistics. That's one of the ways. The other way you deal with that region uh, of reporters who can have and who have contacts with doctors at the clinics, at the hospitals that are treating those patients. Uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. And you try to get um, information from them on at least a weekly basis of the numbers of new cases that are coming through, that have been tested, what the results have been, the number of patients that have come in for treatment. 
you can also do it that way in a more of an anecdotal way. So, but you know, the statistics are the most important part of that. That can be quite hard to get uh, timely statistics. This is a problem in, in most countries uh, where it's very difficult to get um, timely statistics. But the best available, most recent statistics in your region on infections and deaths and hospitalizations is the best thing um, that you can do. Let's move on. We'll talk about that a little bit further. So how do you fact check a leader's false claims? This is a piece uh, from the New York Times that is talking about Mexico are pandemic. So I'll show you how this journalist dealt with it. Next slide. So first, you're saying that the presidents of Brazil and Mexico, um, what is it that they've said and what is it that they've did? They've continued, uh, they've said that they're not going to shut down business and that they are not going to sharply limit public transportation. This is what they've publicly said. So what have they publicly said? And they've also said they think these measures are going to be more devastating than the virus. This is what they've said. You, to be fair, you need to say, what they are, what their claims are, and what their actions are uh, at the beginning of the story. Next slide. So the president of Brazil has called the virus, again, I've put this in quotes because we know it's not true. So you put it in quote marks, call it a measly cold that does not warrant hysteria. So this is what he said. This is what they've done. This is what they said. State the claim, but briefly. Next slide. Then you show the best available evidence. Brazil happens to have a um, very good collection of health statistics, it must be said. So the most recent information they put in this article showing that Brazil had a six-fold increase from a week ago in confirmed cases and in deaths. So just show the evidence. This is what's happening on the ground. These are what statistics are telling us best available, most timely statistics that you have. Make sure and put in, you know, the, when those, what those statistics show. In this case, it was Wednesday morning. Next slide. Then you go to the experts. What are the experts saying, the health experts? They are saying that this approach that Bolsonaro and the president of Mexico are taking could create a breeding ground for the virus with devastating consequences for public health, the economy, and the social fabric. You must talk to several experts and they must be saying broadly the same thing. Now, later on in the story, and I'm gonna suggest all of you read this article and see how this journalist actually then has lots of quotes in from lots of global experts as well as national experts, similar to what I was talking about earlier. This is what experts are saying, they disagree. This is what they're saying. Show the evidence on the part of the health experts. What are scientists saying? Next slide. So now we talk about medical experts at home. And for the elderly and the vulnerable people. Then they show what is the president encouraging? He's encouraged a large rally for his supporters. He's greeted people by shaking their hands and by taking selfies. So once again, here's the evidence from the medical experts, not just in the country, but overseas. And this is what's happening on the ground. So show the and show the actions. Next slide. So a body of search, which goes back quite a long time, a lot of it CDC has found Health authorities should be taking the lead role in providing the health advice with politicians playing a supporting or a reinforcing role. This is the best practices. And I'm here to share the best practices with you. Next slide. As a part of your homework, I'm going to suggest that you all read this article in the New Yorker. 
This is a test case in the United States of the way in which the state of Washington handled the pandemic and the state of New York. In the state of Washington, they let the scientists take the lead in giving health advice. And in New York, the politicians took the lead. And it shows the results and the consequences of what happened in both states as a result. So I'm going to actually suggest before uh, we meet again. Next slide. I'll show you just a couple of examples from this article. Best practice is the lead spokesperson should be a scientist, not a politician. Let's go back, back to an epidemic in the United States, which we've probably forgotten about in the middle of this pandemic, the H1N1, which caused the deaths of 12,000 people in the US and caused the closure of 700 schools. And during that epidemic, it was the CDC director who was an alumnus of something called the EIS, which is an emergency group of people from the CDC, who says, if you have a politician taking that lead role, the risk is that half of the nation who didn't support that leader could do the opposite. That's why a scientist should take the lead role. In the H1N1 uh, epidemic in the United States, it was the director of the CDC that took that lead role that gave the daily health briefings. Next slide. So two people from the CDC gave more than 100 daily press briefings of what was happening. And at that point, the US president didn't speak about the outbreak a lot. He just spoke about it a few times and he pretty much limited himself to telling the American public to follow what scientific, scientific experts are saying and promised uh, not to let politics distort the government's response. That's really the best practices that I'm here to share with you. In the United States, uh, best practices were followed by a lot of US states. Next slide. Uh, I'm also going to I'll take a look at this. Uh, Amy Acton, who was the director of the Ohio Department of Health, the lead on providing health advice in the state of Ohio, one of the states which has managed to keep the number of uh, infections and deaths at a very low level. It's a very interesting video because it dissects the most important parts of the kinds of messages that leaders need to give to make sure that citizens to do the public health measures to the level that we need. Because what we know about this pandemic is that at least 70% to 80% of the public must regularly follow these measures of wearing masks, washing hands, keeping their distance uh, for, in order for us to stop the spread of the pandemic. That's why it's so important that you have uh, a scientist take, take the lead on the, at least the health advice that's provided in a pandemic. Next slide. Any questions on the material so far? Always question. Okay, so we'll take a few because I think you probably have a fair amount to get through and we only have approximately yeah. half an hour left. Yes. But Shall I, do you want me to continue go, we'll take going, you, uh, Russell? I'm happy to keep going. We'll take one now and then we'll have to okay. keep going. And then we'll just have to That's tell right. the, uh, the participants that they can always uh, submit questions online. Yes. All right. Yes. So this one says, how do you get your, your facts or statistics when the, when the health personnel in the government health office tells you he is not in a position to speak to the media? Uh, that's an interesting question. I think uh, I might have mentioned in my last report, if I haven't, I will mention it again here. The health authorities in Nigeria also give some of their information to Johns Hopkins University School of Public Health. They give it to CDC Africa. There are dashboards that both of them produce online that will give you the numbers of new infections. They will provide a timestamp of that information. So you can also go to the CDC and Johns Hopkins. It may not be the information uh, in as great a detail. We'll take a look at tests and give you the information on the case, numbers of new infections and, and possibly other health statistics. Uh, for, you 
sort of froze at the end there, Sarah, so I couldn't hear all of your, your answer. But if I could uh, weigh in, isn't this also a, a question of how the reporter has to use uh, his or her skills to try to convince uh, the health official that there has to be a way that he or she can speak to them? Maybe not on the record as somebody would if they were authorized to speak to the media, but that's when you utilize your ability to get someone to speak off the record, you get someone to speak on background, et cetera, et cetera. So you get the information, which is important to you, and uh, maybe you uh, uh, obtain it in a way that doesn't cause difficulties for your source. Yes, I think that's absolutely true, Russell. Good point. Okay. All right, shall we move on to the next slide? I'm going to suggest that all of you visit this website. We talked about medical research earlier. Uh, you need to understand um, all the different kinds of terms of medical research. This is a wonderful free resource. So I'm gonna suggest that you go there and you become familiar with these medical research terms. Some of them you will be familiar with and others maybe not. Next slide. Uh, these are the key questions that you want to ask. What is the substance uh, that we're talking about, as we saw uh, in the Madagascar thing? Why is it being considered a possible treatment for coronavirus? Can this substance protect you from catching it? And is it approved or is it undergoing regulatory approval? These are some of the key questions you need to ask as a part of your medical research reporting. Next slide. You know, is it being given to patients now? Is there any danger in taking it? If I can get it, should I take it to prevent coronavirus infection? These are the list of key questions that you can follow when you're researching a, a potential cure or treatment of, of any sort. Next slide. Now on re research studies, you need to understand, you know, what we mean by a double blind placebo controlled study. What do we mean by a population study, clinical studies? You need to really bone up on this. This is required reading for all of you to go here and learn how to understand all these different types of studies. Next slide. These are just a few of them. I'm just giving it to you just so as, as a thumbnail sketch. The gold standard are the human studies that are randomized. That means people don't know either the person giving the medication or the person receiving it. You don't know what you're receiving. There's a placebo, so half the people are getting it, the other half are not. That is the gold standard in medical research. But there are also studies of population. That's when we talk about the mask study on Japan, looking at behavior changes in a population and how that impacts on public health. Those are pop population studies done of very large uh, subsets of population of the thousands and even of the millions. Animal studies, of course, looking at how different substances affect rats, mice typically, but sometimes other animals. Lab studies, injecting a substance into a cell culture in a Petri dish. And clinical research, which is going on a lot uh, on, on this pandemic, which is observing how patients are responding to different types of treatments, different types of uh, equipment, different settings on ventilators, You know, based on observation that's built up over many COVID patients. Um, we're also refining our understanding of symptoms and, and treatments as well. So just observations of, of patients. These are some of the most common types of, of studies um, that you'll get familiar with by visiting the health review. Next slide. So let's talk about health data. There, are, there is no perfect health data, I'm afraid to tell you. There are challenges with data that everyone is, is grappling with in every country. Uh, in a perfect world, we would get information on new infections in, in real time, in deaths on, in real time. Uh, but that's not where we are. Again, this is a new pandemic. It has overwhelmed health systems everywhere. It has overwhelmed uh, the people collecting the data, the people inputting the data. There are lags in the data that we don't completely understand anywhere. And you need to be aware of that. Hopefully through time, uh, countries will get better at uh, providing testing data quicker, providing information on infections quicker, but there are lags in our understanding and in our ability to get good data everywhere. It is a challenge. 
for all of us as health journalists. Next slide. So just, you know, keep in mind that uh, even though regulations are being eased to speed up the research for a potential vaccine or treatments, uh, never will one study be enough or be definitive by one scientist to determine anything. There will be many studies that will be done uh, on potential treatments and potential vaccines uh, before there's any of certainty and there's a scientific consensus and realize that, you know, at least 70% of the drugs that are submitted to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration are rejected. And that's after they've gone through several phases of research. So, you know, don't ever rely on one study in your reporting. There will be many studies that will be done over a period of time before scientists develop some kind of a consensus view of where things stand enough to be able to give any kind of advice. So that's just a warning. Next slide. So Nigeria is not the only country that's having these challenges. The Global Investigative Journalist Network is saying that in 2020, the two top challenges for journalists are getting access to data and data being distorted by political leaders by you know, emphasizing the good side of the story and hiding the bad side, which is rising infection rates. This is a challenge in many countries. Next slide. So as I said, there is no perfect way to collect and release data. Uh, the most important indicator on the way in which this pandemic is moving through a population is by looking at the number of new infections. That's the most timely indicator, but it is still lagging. Um, what you need to know is that for the most part, countries making decisions about whether or not to open up the economy further or whether to lock it down further are based on a trend line. They're not based on what's happening every day. Although there are certain uh, changes like huge spikes that could be very concerning over one day, but decisions that governments make are made over looking at the trend line over a couple of weeks time. Day-to-day -day changes can be an indicate that there is an alarming increase in deaths or an alarming increase in infections, but for the most part, you know, it's analyzed over a period of weeks. So that's really the most important indicator that we have. But realize that the number of new infections, and this is a question you must always ask when you do your stories of health statisticians, is how is it affected by the number of tests that are given? Because countries are ramping ability with every day and every week and every month. And this means that the number of infections is going to rise. So you need to also understand how a rise in new infections is also affected by a rise in the number of new tests that are given. The number of deaths is also important to know, but that is what we call more of a lagging indicator because uh, there, most data scientists in the US are saying that the number of deaths that are reported on a daily basis lag by about 21 days. They just use that as an estimate. They don't really know, but they think that that's the best guess that they have to allow for the amount of time for symptoms to appear, to seek medical help, to spend time in the hospital or maybe in an intensive care unit. So that's a more lagging indicator of the snapshot of the progress of the pandemic. Next slide. You need to also understand that when you hear this term uh, out there, uh, the disease is growing at an exponential rate, there's actually a specific statistical definition of what that means, exponential growth. And the definition is cases that are doubling every two to four days. So it's not just a term to throw around out there. There's a specific definition of exponential growth. Next slide. Um, other statistics that are important for you to keep uh, a handle on is the number of patients that are going into critical care. The reason is that shows the stress which is being put on a health system. Every country only has so many beds in their intensive care unit. You need to know how many beds Nigeria has and talk to epidemiologists and find out at what point it shows that the system is under stress. So that's a good thing to know as well. Uh, there's a lot of health statistics that most countries uh, produce on that. And then there's another statistic which is important to know over the long term. It's called the reproduction factor. What that means, it's the average number of people who get affected by every newly infected person. This tells you 
how fast the disease is rising. In a perfect world, the reproduction factor is one person infects another person, and that's it. But that's in a perfect world. Every government sets its reproduction factor at different levels. For example, Germany wants it to be at 1.0, but now it has risen as high as 1.13. Then governments take a look at the RO number to decide whether or not they need to selectively put in place restrictions and in, pla in different places where uh, the disease may be, may be spiking. So the reproduction factor is an also a very important number to know. Next slide. So you need to have a list of health statisticians at different institutions, at Nigeria CDC, in the health ministry, at the World Health Organization, CDC Africa, who you can call on deadline and ask them these questions uh, and get their advice. What do you think about the rise in new infections in the latest report? Uh, are you concerned about a spike on such and such day? They are the ones that can tell you the progress of this disease. Uh, what a lot of countries are doing, I see it here in France uh, by Le Monde, is you actually create a sort of a template story that you can do at least once a week that can be updated regularly that will show the trends of what's happening in terms of new infections and deaths and hospitalizations and other data in your country. But always you need to ask health statisticians, what is your view about the, the way the disease has been developing over the last week or five days or you know whatever you can get your hands on in terms of data. Next slide. Uh, if you can't get data, you can serve as an early warning system uh, by setting up a network of doctors in treatment facilities, hospitals, or NGOs like Doctors with Borders. Have local reporters who can check in on a weekly basis with them and try to get information on deaths, uh, people who've been uh, developing symptoms, people who've been accepted into, uh, into an ICU unit. Or you could set up a WhatsApp group and ask uh, the CDC and the World Health Organization to join and ask them to post in real time in this group that you all have access to uh, any information on new infections and deaths that they get. Um, that's another thing that you, that you can do. So these are other things, other workarounds if you're having difficulty getting data from the health ministry. It's not perfect, but you, these are pretty verified sources of information that you can go to. Next slide. Uh, you also need to decide also with these sources, if, if it's a doctor in a treatment center, whether or not if that uh, doctor goes on the record, is his, his or her life going to be threatened? And of course, always give these sources confidentiality if, if you need it. And also evaluate what you think the repercussions could be on you as a reporter. Uh, this can be dangerous. So, you know, you need to reflect on where confidentiality may be necessary and also evaluate the consequences, which could also be very real on, on you as a reporter. Uh, it can be dangerous business reporting on this in, in, different, uh, in different regions. So you need to think through that carefully. Next slide. I mentioned this in the last uh, session. I think, you know, we're, you're not going to, Rome isn't built in a day and good government is not built in a day. Um, consider publishing an editorial in a legacy outlet that um, tries to hold your government to account on the need for timely and reliable statistics and regular health briefings. Cite best practices in Africa, Ghana, Uganda, Ethiopia perhaps, uh, and beyond like the US state of Washington and, and Germany, for example. You know, hold your governments to account maybe even as a journalism association, submit a letter to the government and the health authorities and, and try to get as many signatories as possible to try to put push pressure on the government on the need to be more transparent and more timely on, on health statistics. Um, why not? Next slide. So think about who are the other partners that have access to health statistics, um, who would need access to good health statistics that the government is collecting. UN agencies, uh, Doctors Without Borders, the World Bank, IMF, they may also have access to this health data. They need it to do their jobs because many of them are financing health infrastructure projects, building uh, COVID treatment centers, 
providing aid for more testing. Uh, they could also have access to it. Unions may have access to health data, uh, or they may also be getting indications of outbreaks in their area. Um, so these are other possibilities uh, to go to for health statistics. Next slide. Sarah, I just want to give you a five minute warning. We're coming to the very end here. We are. Next slide. So these are some of the questions that you're going to ask of your health authorities. You know, what is included in new infections? Um, to get a handle on that, is testing adequate? Are what is included in deaths? For example, in France, for a long time, the only death statistics that were included were those that happened in hospitals, whereas a lot of deaths were happening in care homes. And once they included care homes in France, the numbers of deaths doubled immediately. So, you know, what exactly is included in deaths? And something to think about, which is being monitored more and more uh, across the world, is what we call excess deaths. These are people who are never diagnosed, who are dying at home. This is also uh, people who might have critical conditions, heart conditions, who need a heart operation, who decide to put it off because they are concerned about getting the virus by having a procedure in the hospital. Um, find out if this is also being measured uh, in Nigeria. So these are some of the other things you need to in data itself. Statisticians, the health statistics in Nigeria will be able to answer these questions. I think you need to give this information to your public more broadly. So I think we'll leave it there for now, Russell, and I'll take uh, any remaining questions. Okay, thank you. Yes, we'll try to get a couple in before it's time to uh, depart today. So one question asks, how do we report COVID-19 research efforts by local scientists when there is not much evidence on the validity of those researches? Well, I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to in terms of um, local scientists, you know, where they work. I would hope that they are following international best practices in the research methodology that they use. Um, for example, I would imagine that your uh, National Institute of Medical Research, which has international well institutions, uh, would be following best practices say get the information I'm not exactly sure where these scientists work but perhaps you could take the research and run it past the World Health Organization run it past CDC Africa run it past your National Institute of Medical Research and get their view on whether or not this science is uh, well constructed well designed before you decide to publish this is actually a problem with with COVID as you know there is a very uh, intense search now it's very urgent to find treatments um, some scientists are rushing to publish information quickly on the internet without having it vetted. Um, it's becoming a little bit crazy. So I would say if I were you, I would take that information and get it verified by two or three other respected authorities before you publish. Related to that, uh, a questioner asks, why do we seem to have conflicting clinical reports on hydroxychloroquine? Some were emphatic about its inefficacies. Others discover a ray of hope in its application to certain patients. Why can't the WHO get a grip on this and take a position? Well, I think that's a very important question to ask. And I think it gets to the heart of what it is to be a health reporter. Um, once again, uh, we're at the very early stages of studying all the different treatments which could possibly help people with COVID-19. and because of this, I'm going to have to say wild west that is going on where so many people are now out there studying something like hydroxychloroquine. Um, and some of them are not using good data and some of them are not using well designed research studies. And um, it's all being published very quickly. It's creating a lot of confusion because we're not really following the, the procedures that we used to follow. Uh, because people are rushing to publish. I don't blame you for being confused. I think the best that we can do, I'll talk about the World Health Organization in a moment, is to just publish 
the very best available research that we know, just like I showed you in the examples that I showed you, and to put in a line there that at this point, there is not scientific consensus. Research is still at a very early stage. Some of the studies are showing there could possibly be promise, for example, for mild COVID patients, as you saw in that Chinese study. Others are showing that there could be problems. There is not widespread consensus. And side of being a health reporter. All we can do is present the evidence, the best available, best designed research is, and say to our readers, um, showing some promise here, some, some science donations, um, are, nobody is condoning hydroxychloroquine right now that I'm aware of. Um, it's changing with every week and all we can do is give the very best available evidence to people to our readers and tell them that we don't know yet. There is no scientific consensus. We have to be honest with our readers. That's something that journalists don't really know how to do. We have to tell them what we know and what we don't know. I love that. Journalists have to be honest as well about what they don't yes, know. Do. Now, we'll make this the last question. Okay. Um, this questioner says, saving lives versus saving the economy is an indication the globe is in a dilemma. What's the prevailing solution out of the logjam? That I seem to go beyond the realm of reporting, but take your best uh, answer. <laughs> well, I said to you earlier, and I still stand to this, uh, that you know many political leaders are creating this false sense of saving the economy versus saving lives. And I think that it's creating this idea in our heads truth is that we've got to follow the best available health measures um, to safely open the economy. We can't open up too soon and drop those public health measures. That's the real answer here. Uh, and, and this is the problem. Um, under what conditions are you opening the economy? The conditions, the public health conditions have to be in place. For example, before, if uh, you have a widespread lockdown on businesses, for example, you can't really reopen those businesses until the businesses have been able to put in place the public health measures which are being recommended. For example, um, distancing measures on, on elevators, getting uh, employees to take the stairs instead of taking the elevators, putting in place plexiglass barriers in open plan settings. Business has, business has to be given enough time to put in place those public health measures before it can open. Um, so that's really the answer. The answer is our government put in place and giving you know businesses enough time to put in place those public health measures so that it can open safely. To me, that's really the answer. You really still have to stick to the science and what the health authorities are saying we need to put in place to protect people because in the end, we will not have, uh, we will have a spike in infections and we will have to go back into lockdowns and it will actually in the long run hurt the economy more uh, in the long run uh, if we don't do the right things now to protect our, our citizens. Thank you very much. That would be great. You're welcome. All right, any final words? Because we are gonna have to wrap it up. Uh, these sessions are only intended to be 90 minutes and Sarah has provided a yes. bountiful fest of information, but we are gonna have to wrap it up. So any final words? I think if I... go at polls and look at those videos and visit um, sources that you can go to fact checking tools and understanding medical research if you could each spend a couple of hours before we meet again and go and get familiar with some of these tools i think that us educating yourself will go a long way for you to become familiar with reporting on what can often be a rather technical and sometimes a rather um, difficult um, body to, to report on. So I would urge you all to spend a couple of hours before we meet again. So thank you very much for your time. Excellent, thank you. So the last session in this series will take place on the 11th. Same time, 10 o'clock uh, local time, we will begin, we will begin on time. And these, as I said, are only intended to be 90 minutes in length, 
I see some of you sort of joined the session in the final five, 10 minutes. Actually, you're doing yourself a disservice. You're not gonna get anything out of that. We begin at 10 o'clock. I encourage you all to be present at 10 o'clock to participate in this. There's a lot of information. As you can tell, we don't have as much time as you would like for questions. We will do the best we can. But I saw roughly about 40 participants today, uh, maybe uh, slightly off. I saw 70 uh, in uh, the first session. We cannot get to you all. We will do the best we can, but we cannot answer all of your questions. But again, thank you for participating. Thank you, Sarah. I look forward to our final uh, session on the 11th. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.